and actually, you know, being a finance nerd, I guess, I calculated <laughs> what I would have spent in that week being in the country versus being out of the country and actually saved more money being out of the country than I would have in the country, which is wow. crazy. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Dylan Callier. I'm a physical therapist and welcome to the new Medical Nomads podcast, where I get to document my journey as a medical traveler, as well as interview other experts within the traveling field. Now, the rules for the traveling game are constantly changing, so anything you hear on this show should be for entertainment purposes only. This is not legal, financial, or medical advice. Enjoy the show and safe travels. to another episode of the New Medical Nomads podcast. My name is Dylan, and this is the last part of our little mini series here with Dr. Jared Kazaza, talking all about finances. Um, the previous two were talking about uh, loan repayments. Um, the last one was talking about investments, and now we're starting to talk about financial independence and um, retiring early as a traveler. But uh, Jared, could you give us a little bit of your background, your story, and why you made this decision going into traveling physical therapy? Yeah, so I decided my first year of PT school that I was going to travel, and the reason I decided that is because I had this clinical um, after my first year at a inpatient rehab facility uh, where there was a traveler working there, and uh, I had heard about travel before and I thought it'd be a pretty cool thing to check out after graduation, but I hadn't really thought a lot about it. Um, I talked to him and uh, he was like, uh, yeah, travel's great. Uh, you get to see all these places and uh, you make a lot more money. And I was like, well, man, that's exactly what I want to do. <laughs> so, uh, so I decided then that I was going to travel. Um, this is before I met my girlfriend. And when I met her, it just so happened that she was in the same year of PT school, but she was going to a school about five hours away. Hmm. Um, so I told her when we started dating, I was like, well, you know, once I graduate, I plan to travel. And she was like, oh, well, I'd never really thought about it, but uh, that might be a cool thing to try. And, uh, you know, I told her some of my conversation with him and, um, and all the benefits. And, uh, but for me, it was always my primary motive was pay. So I, going into it, you know, the, the traveling aspect and seeing new places and everything is definitely really cool. But the pay is the the big factor that that um, made it the best option for me, I guess, and how I, I chose. Um, when I went into it as well, I decided that for my first two or three years traveling, my, my goal, me and my girlfriend talked about it, we decided that our goal was to travel for five years. Um, we wanted to buy a camper because we decided that uh, moving was terrible and uh, <laughs> packing and moving is too much of a hassle. So, we knew we wanted to buy a camper. And so basically we went into it knowing that we wanted to save as much as we possibly could. And uh, in order to do that, we decided that we were gonna take as little time off between contracts as possible because obviously the more time you take off, the, the more you lose in income. Um, you know, we don't get the benefit of vacation days and sick time and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So since we started traveling two and a half years ago, I've taken a, a total of two weeks off and that was um, that was one to make sure that I maintained my tax home, uh, last year and also to go out of the country for a week. We went to Jamaica. So that was really cool. Um, but besides that, we haven't taken any, any days off that were unpaid wow. in two and a half years. So that's definitely not the traditional way to do it. But the reason I'm doing it that way is so that later on I'll be in a good enough financial situation that I don't have to work at all if I don't want to. So, um, I think that hustling while you're young and getting the benefit of that compounding interest early on is uh, huge. So I've spent this two and a half years really buckling down and just working a lot. And, uh, and now I'll hopefully start reaping the rewards in a couple, a year or two. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, I was reading one of your, one of your blogs and it talked about, you know, your first year out of school that you were able to make above six figures as a physical therapist, which is, if you go the traditional route, that is like unheard of. Maybe you'll be able to get that, you know, up in Alaska doing a very niche thing, uh, maybe like pediatrics or something. But from, especially from Missouri, like you got to be in the game for a long time in order to start making that kind of money or be um, an owner or something of some sort. So uh, that is, that is very cool. And then in that, 
blog, you were talking about um, the term FIRE. And I believe it stood for financial independence and then retiring early. And could you kind of just go into what financial independence is for you? Um, so I definitely like to use the, the term financial independence over retirement because retirement has a lot of negative connotations, I found. Um, you know, when you... I've, I've talked to so many people. I try not to bring this up unless somebody's interested because otherwise it's just going to cause problems. So, but when you talk to people and you tell them that you want to retire early, they're like, Oh, well, what are you going to do? You're just going to, you're going to sit on the couch all day and, and watch Netflix. And it's like, man, if that's what you're <laughs> with, with your free time, then your life is very sad. Um, so anyway, financially into being financially independent basically means that, you have enough coming in from investments that you can cover all of your living expenses without working. And um, there's something called the 4% rule, which now to me seems like, uh, um, like seems like everybody would know that, but I know that two and a half years ago when I started uh, reading that I had no idea what it was. So mm. uh, I'll explain that a little bit. And basically what that means is whatever you have invested in a well diversified portfolio, um, what money you have and, and like we talked about last time, likely in index funds, um, you can withdraw 4% of that a year and your chances of running out of money are extremely, extremely low. And the reason for that is average return is eight to 10% in the stock market, but mm -hmm. there are years where the return might be negative 50%. So you will, there's been uh, a lot of research done, historical data analyzed to determine that 4% number. And basically what they've come up with is that even with those huge drawdowns like that, 4% is conservative enough that you would never run out of money. Um, uh, or not never, but the, the uh, odds are like 98% likely that you won't, which is uh, low enough that um, it's probably safe to take the risk. So mm -hmm. for me, um, I've come up with the number that I'm trying to reach that I can w live on 4% and be, be happy with, uh, with my quality of life and my standard of living. And, um, that's what I'm shooting for right now is just getting to that number so that I can, uh, then that at that point work becomes optional. And it's not that I don't want to work because I probably mm -hmm. will work part time as a PT. I like it. It's just that, um, you know, I think everybody can relate to the fact that 40 hours a week is a lot of work and sometimes mm -hmm. it's stressful. And, uh, I think if I had the option, I would probably work two or three days a week instead of five days a week. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that's kind of my goal. Got it. Got it. Um, so you've done, you've done the math, you calculated it. Do you have a certain age that you're trying to retire by? So, um, actually my girlfriend and I were talking earlier today and, um, she's got this, uh, thing she wants to go to in Morocco uh -huh. in July. It's a, uh, women's health thing and she wants to go to it really bad. And she was like, it's really, it's really cheap. And, and we could go, you can go together and you could just hang out there in Morocco while I go to these courses and it'll be a lot of fun. And I've been so focused on saving and investing and everything that, uh, you know, at first I was like, no, no, I can't do that. I still have, uh, still have about a year to go. So my, my original goal when I started all this was 32. Wow. And, um, that seemed like it seemed young, but yeah. at the same time I would be working for five years and all of that would be traveling and I'd be making a lot of money mm -hmm. and, uh, investing all of it or majority of it. And, um, and I based that number on what I predicted my future expenses to be and not my current expenses, because obviously after having kids and things, uh, your expenses are going to go up. So, um, that's what I based everything on. I went back maybe like six or nine months ago and went through my assumptions for like what my expenses would be like then and reduced it a little bit because I think that they were pretty high. So that changed things. And now I'm somewhere around 30, um, should be, which is about a year, a year and five months from now. Um, and then when she started talking about this Morocco trip, I was like, you know what, actually right now, I, based on the 4% rule, if I kept my current standard of living, like I could live indefinitely already. Um, you know, it's just based on this future expenses. And mm -hmm. like I said, I'm probably going to work part time later anyway. So mm -hmm. it's not really a huge deal. So there's a chance that, uh, in July I might be taking 36 months off to go to Morocco and Southeast Asia and, uh, Europe. So, um, but yeah, right now the, uh, if that doesn't happen, the plan is work for another year and a half or so mm -hmm. and I'll be financially independent then. Okay. Okay. Very, very good. Yeah. Um, and I would say that is definitely, at least on this show, much different than how everybody else is going about it. They're, what I plan on doing is, you know, once a year going out 
out of the country or doing a trip, taking off time, and then doing many retirements kind of as I work, where yeah. you were just blocking it out, chunking it out, and then, you know, having the, the big the big retirement then. Well, I would say for most people, what you're talking about is uh, probably a lot better option. Um, the only thing about the mini retirements like you're talking about is um, I wouldn't plan on that being like one or two weeks. Um, you know, if you can, if you can do that and make it like a month, because when you go out of the country, if you're only gone for a week and a week or two, you know, you barely even acclimate to the, uh, the change in the time zones and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and not that I have much experience with going out of the country <laughs> yet, but from what I've read, um, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd rather spend like two or three months and uh, you know, as you'll figure out with traveling, when you spend two or three months in a place, you really feel like you start to, to know the area and you know the people and you know the places to go and things like that. So I want to spend um, a significant amount of time in each place instead of just going for a week or two. So that's kind of the reason that I've done it the way I've done it. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of doing those more mini retirements. And, um, and we've talked about possibly um, spending a few months out of the out of the year out of the country and then maybe taking one or two travel assignments just to um, keep our skills fresh and everything mm -hmm. uh, we might end up doing that but um, but yeah I think I think probably for most people taking time off like that is a, a better option so you don't burn out uh, yeah yeah and I agree with that I when I'm planning these trips I'm like minimum a month preferably yeah. to um, just because and oh, i you know, when I, when I accepted this permanent position, I was talking with some people and they're like, Oh, you know, you want to travel. That's great. You know, you could take a continuing education course somewhere in Virginia for like a three day weekend and then come back. I was like, no, that's not, you're not even getting to uh, experience the culture there. Exactly. And, and I would say the same thing with one or two weeks. I want to like live in a place for a month to two months and really experience it that way. And the good way you just get the touristy stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the other thing about it is when you stay only for a week or two in a place, your, your expenses are so much higher mm -hmm. uh, versus like, so say you stayed in Airbnb, almost all Airbnbs have a discount for monthly rentals. So if you stay three days, you're going to be paying a lot more per day than if you stay a month. Mm. So if you can get yourself in a good enough financial situation where you can afford to go out of the country for a month or two, you can really decrease your daily expenses, you know, your average daily expenses by a lot by staying out of the country for longer. In addition to all the other benefits of really becoming more immersed in the culture and everything, which is uh, important to me for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh shoot. I just had a question. When you're coming across those contracts, when you're working with your recruiters, trying to find the next position, um, what's kind of, your guidelines when you're discovering which um, opportunity to take? Are you just looking for the biggest cash pull in order to um, where your next uh, stay is going to be? Or is it a little more complex than that? Well, I would say we've basically stayed on the East Coast. So we're from Virginia. Um, and the reason, a lot of the reason why we stayed on the East Coast is because um, because of the whole tax home situation. I don't know how much you guys have talked about that, but mm. Um, you know, 30 days you're supposed to spend at your tax home. If I'm close enough that I can drive home for the weekends um, and try to meet that 30 days without taking time off of work, then mm. obviously I can save even more money that way. Mm. So part of it has been like staying in, uh, staying within maybe five to six hours so that I can occasionally go home for the weekend and count that as two days at my tax home. Um, uh, part of it's pay, of course. Uh, I would say the main factor for both my girlfriend and I is uh, outpatient jobs. So we, um, we've both taken sniff jobs, uh, traveling. I took one, she's taken three now and, uh, we're not huge fans of sniffs. I uh, <laughs> would much rather be an outpatient. Um, so that's usually the biggest factor. Okay. Um, I've taken an acute care job. I've taken, um, a partial home health job before, but yeah, outpatient's the biggest factor. The other thing is finding a campground that's, uh, somewhere within driving distance between these two jobs. And uh, obviously, uh, we're a lot more limited in the jobs we can accept because we have to have first two jobs that are close to each other, ideally at least one of them outpatient, if not both. And there has to be a campground somewhere either in between or very close that we can drive. So I think that we've been very, very fortunate finding, um, finding jobs. I think eight, eight of my 10 contracts now have been outpatient, which is uh, mm. difficult when you're traveling as a couple. 
mm-hmm. and and looking for campgrounds. So uh, so we've gotten lucky with that, and um, those are usually our determining factors. Uh, pay also goes into it, but I would rather take a lower paying outpatient job than a higher paying sniff job any day. So. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Um, yes, I think everybody has their preferred setting for sure. And I, I would agree with that. I've had a couple, well, I've had clinicals and I've, I've been working now patient now patients, definitely my preferred route. Um, and I've done acute, I've done ICU, but yeah, SNFs, um, the skilled nursing facility, there's just something about arguing with people in order to do their exercises that just drains me. Well, even worse than that is, uh, you know, the management and SNFs and uh, productivity requirements and, I honestly working with the patients is the best part uh, <laughs> trying to get 90% productivity when you know that's impossible is uh, the part that frustrates me and makes it not worth it. So it. Um, even though I've taken a sniff job, I worked there for four months. I, I really don't plan on ever doing that again. Got it. Got it. And uh, you made me promise not to call it a trailer park when we were talking about your campgrounds. Yes. <laughs> When you were making that decision, um, you were looking at it for um, you and your significant other. And I imagine if like I as a single person would look into it, I would either need to be traveling for a while or um, re- really that would be it. I'd have to travel for a while in order to make sure that it was a beneficial um, investment in order to take the home with me. Um, when you made that decision, was it more for the packing that you didn't want to spend time doing, or was it more for the financial incentive of being able to pull in some extra cash and not pay it towards rent? Yeah, it was both. Um, uh, when you start looking into campers, uh, you know, I looked into the cost a lot. I looked into how much campgrounds would cost. Um, and yeah, you have to be traveling. What I've determined, uh, I've done some calculations on this and I did a poll in a couple different groups with people that either have campers or take short term, short term housing. And what I found is that on average, you save about 450 to $500 um, on monthly expenses in a campground versus being in a, uh, a short term rental. So that 500 is a lot, but you have to look at the upfront cost of a, of a camper itself. Mm-hmm. So I think you probably need to travel for about a year and a half to two years to make it worth it. If you're traveling less than that, it, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense, especially with the learning curve that goes along with like, pulling a camper and uh, uh, repairs that might pop up and stuff like that. Um, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and that, that one and a half to two year number is including the fact that we bought our, our camper and truck used. So the depreciation is a lot lower. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're buying a new truck and a new camper, uh, I would say you probably need to be looking to travel for three to four years before okay. the monthly cost outweighs the uh, depreciation. Got it. Got it. And now the, for a single traveler, um, I, I imagine couples that are looking to do that. And that, that's what I've seen is most um, people with a mobile home are traveling as a couple that they start pulling that financial um, gain much sooner than a, a single would. Well, I would actually, uh, I would argue that traveling by yourself, you might actually come out better. Really? Well, just because if it was me traveling by myself, I would probably have an SUV um, and I would pull a, a very small camper, um, probably somewhere between 15 and 20 feet uh, would be plenty for me. Whereas with me and my girlfriend, we had to get a, a big fifth wheel. Like ours is 33 feet. So it's it's big. And of course, it's more expensive. And then to pull it, you have to buy a truck that's expensive. Um, so yeah, if I was traveling by myself, I'd probably buy a used 20 foot camper that I could get for maybe um, $5,000 or so. I would buy a used SUV that I could pull it with. And, uh, you know, of course, with a high enough tow rating that you could pull it. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I would probably actually save more that way, even though um, you wouldn't benefit as much from the, the monthly savings, I guess, in a, uh, as a couple. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Um, something else that I read in your blog that I wanted to talk about was that you had said that you'd taken some PRN jobs on the side as well as working that, that travel gig. Um, when you did take those PRN jobs, how did you find those? Um, I guess that's, that's really my, my big question is how, how would you find those being away from your, um, your home? Well, I, uh, the, I only actually took one PRN job and that was on my very first assignment okay. and it just fell in my lap. Really. I was, uh, I was working at this hospital based, um, well, it was a hospital based outpatient, but also acute care. Mm-hmm. And, um, 
I was taking over for this full-time PT that was leaving. And one day I was just like uh, asking her about like stuff to do around there before she left. And um, she was orienting me and everything. And uh, she mentioned that she was going to her PRN job. I was like, Oh, where is it? And she was like, Oh, it's a, uh, it's a skilled nursing across the street. And I was like, Oh man, that sounds awesome. <laughs> obviously she's leaving. So, um, so I contacted them and she contacted them as well and was like, well, I'm leaving, but there's this guy that's coming here as a traveler that's willing to work there part time as well. So, I mean, actually finding the job, if you didn't have a situation like that is definitely going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know from that scenario, it took almost a month from the time I contacted them before I could actually work because of, um, interviewing and the hiring process and, uh, filling out paperwork and, you know, it was just, a, it was a pretty big hassle. So if you're only going to be in a place for three months, most of the time I would imagine it doesn't make sense to do that because you're probably only going to be working at that job for two months. And a lot of times they're not going to want you to do that. You know, if they know you're a traveler and you're going to be leaving, they don't want to invest the time into orienting you when you're only going to be there two months. So, um, I would say for most people finding a PRN job and an assignment is probably not the best use of your time. Um, but if it falls into your lap like that, like if I had a situation like that again, I would, I would do it again. Got it. But I'm not going to go out of my way to find it for sure. I see. I see. Yeah. If you are a listener and listening to this and you've worked PRN, please reach out to me. Cause I'm, that's definitely something I would like to learn about. And the only way, unless somebody can um, kind of educate me it, that I think it would work is if you worked for a big company, a chain company that would like spread over a region of uh, the U S and you could go through the documentation, learn the hiring process, the paperwork. And then if you were to go to an, another place where another facility of that company was nearby, then you could just almost transfer. Yeah. And I think probably the easiest PRN job that you could get would be uh, home health because obviously people's homes don't really change. You don't have to orient much to, to that. Um, the only thing that would change would be the documentation. So if you, if you had experience with the documentation system, then jumping into a new PRN home health job would be, mm -hmm. Um, pretty easy, I would say. So okay. um, that's probably the, uh, if you, somebody really wanted to do that, that's probably the best way to go. So I'm right. Got it. Yeah. And that's just strictly speaking on the therapist side of things. I'm not sure um, if nurses would have that option or not. That's true. Um, it's something that I'm just not educated on. And then I got my list of questions. We had reached out to some of the listeners and, uh, asked what they would want to talk about. And we had kind of covered on this last um, episode, but Jacqueline wanted us to talk about um, taking 401k options from recruitment companies. And then how else do you, are you saving for a retirement? Yeah. So um, like I said, in the last one, I think that the, the best way to go about it for most travelers that don't plan to travel for very long or plan to jump around from, from company to company and they're not going to get the benefit of the matching, whatever matching the company offers is to probably go with the traditional IRA and just uh, invest in that yourself up to mm -hmm. 5,500. If you want to invest more than that, then yeah, 401k is a pretty good option and uh, rolling it into the, the traditional IRA. Once you're, once you leave that company is really not a hard process. So I would say invest in your traditional IRA up to the mat or up to the uh, limit and then invest in your, 401k as much as you can. And then when you leave the company roll it into that traditional IRA. So, um, that's probably the, the best way to go about it. Very good. Very good. And then before we get into, I, um, maybe like three or four remaining questions that are kind of, um, off the topics that we had discussed before we started recording, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about with financial independence or retirement, um, early retirement or anything like that? Well, one thing I was, uh, I was going to talk about a little bit is um, it's because of, I haven't found a lot of uh, PRN opportunities like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I've been, if any assignment I go to, I have the ability or the option to work overtime. I've been taking that. Okay. Um, a lot of assignments don't allow that, but every now and then you'll find one that they're desperate and they'll, they'll work you as much as you want to be worked. <laughs> um, so in my two and a half years of traveling, you know, when I first started, everybody was like, Oh, you don't get overtime as a traveler. It just doesn't work that way. Well, I've gotten 400 hours of overtime so far in wow. two, and a half, two and a half years of traveling. So you definitely can get those opportunities um, if you're looking for it. And, you know, when, when I start a new assignment, if it's somewhere I like and I'm willing to work there extra, then I'll, I'll ask them if that's an option and um, I'll work overtime as much as I can. And obviously that just puts you closer and closer to your goal. Um, 
one thing I would say for people starting out, if you're interested in financial independence, or even if you're not interested in that, you don't, you don't care about retiring early, you, you want to continue to work. Um, I would really encourage everyone to determine what number they need to save to retire. Because I, I would imagine that probably 90%, 95% of the population, if you ask them like, well, when are you going to retire? They'll say, I don't know, or uh, 65, or they just say like a number, mm -hmm. right? But they have no idea how much they need to save to get there. Um, and that just amazes me because that's, that could be one of the most important points of your life and you don't know how much you need to save to get there. Um, so at what point are you going to figure it out? You know, you're going to wait until you're 60 and you have five years to go and then you try to determine. So, um, but basically the way to do that, like I was talking about with the 4% rule is you determine how much your expenses are going to be when you retire or, or what you go by your current expenses. Usually is the easiest way to do that. Um, and then, you figure out how much you need um, to sustain that amount of spending. And the way to do that is find your monthly expenses, multiply that by 12 to get your yearly expenses, and then multiply that by 25. And that is the number you're shooting for. So whether you want to retire at 30 or you want to retire at 65, that's somewhere around the number that you're going to need. Okay. So I would encourage everyone to, to figure out what that number is for them and then set up a plan to get there at whatever age you want to get there. And, uh, you know, that's the most important thing of probably – anything you do in life is uh, set up a plan, figure out what the goal is and how to get there. And then just methodically carry that out. Got it. Got it. Um, that, that last multiplier, that 25, is that, where does that number come from? So that comes from, uh, you know, basically the inverse of um, dividing by, or not dividing by, but taking 4% of that total number. Okay. So 4% of that total nest egg is what you need to live on per year then taking your yearly expenses and multiplying by, by 25 will give you the same number. Got it. Okay. Or if it makes it simpler, you could divide by 0 0.04 and that would give you the same. It's the same Got as dividing by Okay. Two. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then you would be able to count, you know, basically how many years that whether you be 30, 32, all the way to 65, how many years you're expecting to live, I suppose, and what you would need that way. Um, yeah. Which, I mean, people are getting older every day, you know, medical, um, and technology is getting more advanced. And I, I think that original 65 year old um, retirement law that went into, went into effect was developed a long time ago. And I'm surprised that they haven't tried to re redo that law in order to get it, get it older. I remember learning about that in um, our healthcare class. And I imagine, um, or not, I imagine, I remember the talk going that, when 65 years old was determined that that would be the cutoff, that was like 80% of people would have been passed away by then. And so only 20% remained. And that's how they based off their, their financial decision to make that the cutoff. Yeah, well, that's not a, the case anymore. <laughs> exactly. And there's a lot of discussion about that because social security as it's set up right now is um, it's, uh, it's not sustainable because of that. Um, you know, I think the average lifespan now compared to when, that um, social security number was um, determined or the age that you can take social security. Uh, it's probably increased at least 20 years, I would imagine. Um, so yeah, those rules based on people dying around 65 or 70 don't really apply anymore. And uh, so the only way to make it that um, social security will be sustainable in the future is either to reduce the payout or to increase the age at which you can take it. And uh, chances are, you know, in the next five or 10 years, we'll see, legislation happen where the, uh, the age that you can take it is going to be, you know, 70, 75, something like that mm -hmm. older, or they'll reduce the, uh, the benefit, the payout. So Got it. one of those is probably going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, all right. And then kind of just going into um, some of these other questions that people had reached out about. So Jocelyn, Jocelyn, excuse me, wanted to ask, um, about the tax home question. Do you still maintain a tax home with your um, trailer? Also any experience or comments on a health share plan or medical sharing? Yeah. Um, in a camper, as long as you have a, a tax home and you're paying rent at the campground, then it still counts as uh, duplicate expenses. So I do have a tax home at my, in my hometown. I, uh, I rent a room at my mom's house. So I have that as my tax home. I go back to it at least 30 days a year 
and then um, I have receipts from the campground rent that my girlfriend and I split. And um, so as long as you're doing it that way, you know, that's, that's uh, within the tax code and legal to do it that way. Um, as far as healthcare sharing ministries, uh, I think that's probably what she's asking about is there's uh, some healthcare sharing Christian ministries that exist. Mm -hmm. and they, they seem like very good options um, for a lot of people. Uh, I think not so much younger people. Cause like I was talking about, I think in the last episode, um, when you're younger, your medical expenses are lower. Um, those healthcare sharing ministries, I think their, their, um, premiums are usually a little higher, okay. um, but for the most part, I think they're a good option. Uh, if you, if you could, I think a lot of them have stipulations that you have to be Christian. So obviously that, that, um, makes it not, uh, eligible for some people, mm. but if you are Christian and you can, uh, I don't, I don't know how they check that, but, uh, <laughs> but if, uh, if that's an option for you, I would definitely reach out to them and see what your, your, uh, premium would be there compared to, uh, traditional health insurance. Um, I know that a lot of travelers choose to have their own coverage and, uh, it makes a lot of sense because if you're changing companies and you're not taking back to back contracts, um, it's nice to have your own coverage, but mm. Uh, the trade-off there is that it's going to be more expensive. Like my, my premium right now through this company, I think is about $25 a, a week. So that's about a hundred dollars a month. Wow. And I don't think there's any, any coverage you can get in the, um, mm. the marketplace. That's anywhere near that. Um, yep. So the health insurance question, it really comes down to you. How much are you going to plan on traveling? Um, are you going to take long gaps between assignments? If you are, then it probably makes more sense to have your own coverage. If you're not, then, you know, taking the company, um, healthcare is probably the best option. Yeah. Um, shout out to Laura Latimer. She went into, um, kind of the different health insurance options to cover yourself not too long ago, um, with Nomadicare. And she talked about those Christian based healthcare, um, shares, and they're also very um, oh, restrictive, not the right term, but they're also very protective of their own group. So if you have any pre-existing conditions, um, they're not really bound by law in order to accept you. So they will make sure that you are healthy before they bring you in. And then they also have those other stipulations, whether they be religious, religion based or anything else that they kind of make their own rules in order for you to be included in that group. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you were talking about, you know, well, I guess it's a, it's a hundred dollars a month for you for coverage. I was just looking at, I'm, I'll be leaving my permanent job here very soon and starting my first travel gig. So I'm trying to make that decision of, do I go with the ACA or Obamacare option? Do I take the Cobra to kind of uh, transition that over or do I take my, the company that I'll be working with, do I take what they're offering for a health insurance benefit? And so far, two of the three options, bare minimum, if I'm lucky, is going to be 400 bucks um, a month. So yeah. I, I would definitely say whenever I'm able to find out the new company's um, health benefits and their insurance plan, uh, it, most likely that's probably going to be the route that I end up going. Well, and, and what a lot of people don't realize too, what you're talking about there with Cobra is, um, if you take a three month assignment and you plan to go to um, Europe for a month after that assignment, people think, Oh, well, I'm not gonna have any coverage there. Well, that's not the case. You can still use your co uh, Cobra coverage between contracts. And the cool thing about Cobra is that it's retroactive, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that if you took that month off and you didn't need any kind of health, health insurance, as long as you're not doing that, um, I guess more than three months a year to qualify for the, uh, um, what is it? The, there's like a, a fine that is placed on you if you don't have health insurance for a certain number of mm -hmm. months per year. I think it's nine that you have to have health insurance. So, so say you, uh, you go to Europe for a month uh, between contracts, nothing happens to you. You come back, you start a new assignment, then you don't need to sign up for Cobra. But if while you're, uh, you know, at the airport, you <laughs> fall and break your arm, then you sign up for Cobra retroactively and they would cover from the date that you, uh, date that you ended your assignment. So mm -hmm. I think that there's, um, for most people, I think that they come out ahead, taking the company insurance. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, that you're not just high and dry between assignments. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, um, I know I had heard that on the webinar that Laura gave and she said, I think she had to call the company like three times just to make sure that that was the actual thing, that it was a retroactive policy, um, yeah. which is still like blowing my mind. So definitely, you know, make your own decisions, make the phone calls before you make any type of health insurance decisions. 
And again, yeah. we're not any type of professionals on this matter or um, finances. We're just two dudes having a conversation about money. Yeah, um, I, I could be making all this up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, moving to the next one, Kaylee wants to know, can you talk about credit cards for travelers? And she had talked about maybe some several type of benefits. I'm trying to remember the original question um, or interest-free um, options. And I don't know if that was referring to credit cards or not, but I'll let you kind of take that. Credit cards have been uh, a huge, huge um, savings for me, I would say, um, in the last three years or so. Um, it probably sounds kind of crazy, but uh, you know, when I went into all this financial independence and learned about personal finance, learned about savings, I wanted to do anything I possibly could to make extra money. And what I found with that is that uh, not only do credit cards have cash back on purchases, so since from the time I was 18, I've gotten uh, between one and 2% cash back at least on every purchase I've ever made um, that would take a credit card from that point on. So um, one time I went back and tried to add that up, but it's uh, of course very difficult to think about <laughs> 10 years of cash back. But anyway, it's a big number. I mean, probably uh, 10,000 or more, I would say. Wow. Um, and then in addition to that, there's the sign up bonuses that are, that are huge. So uh, I didn't discover this until really probably about three years ago, how lucrative the sign up bonuses can be. But for people that travel a lot, like between assignments or um, maybe they want to take a big trip like I'm planning um, and have hotel options and stuff like that, um, these sign-up bonuses can be worth a lot of money, like $1,000 $1, or more. Um, and <clears throat> the way that works, you sign up for a card. Most of the time they have a, a, a stipulation. It'll be like you'll earn 50,000 points after you spend 3,000 in three months or something like that. And depending on the card and the program, that what that 50,000 points is worth uh, will vary greatly. Um, but uh, a lot of the programs like Chase, City, American Express, you can transfer those miles or those points to uh, frequent flyer programs and hotel programs um, to earn free flights and free hotels. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of those cards are the most valuable because you have a lot of options as to where you wanna transfer the points to. Um, and Chase has an interesting rule where you can't have more than um, five new accounts open in the last 24 months or they want to prove you for a lot of their cards. So when people are asking about credit card rewards, I always tell, tell them to start with Chase because, um, you know, once you get past that five new accounts, then you're just locked out for the next 24 months from their <laughs> card. So you want to get those early. Um, I would say uh, each, each company has their own premium card, like uh, – for American Express, they have the Platinum card. For Chase, they have the Sapphire Reserve card. And for City, they have the City Prestige. And those cards are, they have the most benefits, but they also have a pretty big annual fee. And the annual fee is not waived. So um, for all of them, it's between $450 and $550 a month. Or uh, sorry, not a month, a year um, yeah. for the annual fee. So for people that travel a lot, those cards can make sense to get and keep. Um, almost all of them make sense to get for the first year because of that big sign up bonus. So most of them are 50 or 60,000 points, which is uh, those points are worth more than that $450 or $550 um, annual fee. But after that first year, uh, it's kind of hard to justify unless you travel a lot. Um, for me, you know, not taking much time off between contracts, it didn't make any sense to keep, mm. but I would say that those big premium cards like that are probably a good place to start. Um, and, once you have that transferable currency, you can transfer it to American Airlines or United or um, Hyatt or anything like that. And, um, and you can get a lot of value out of that. Um, Whitney and I, we took a trip in September to Jamaica for six days and all of it was free. The flights were free. Wow. All inclusive resort was free for all those days. Um, and actually, you know, being a finance nerd, I guess I calculated <laughs> what I would have spent in that week being in the country versus being out of the country. <laughs> And actually saved more money being out of the country than I would have in the country, which is wow. crazy. <laughs> um, and actually in two weeks, I'm going to Aruba. I'm taking my little brother on a, uh, a vacation trip or uh, sorry, not a vacation trip, a graduation trip. Um, <laughs> graduated high school in June. Okay. So I'm taking him to Aruba for a week and all that's going to be free. Um, and then in addition to that, I've, uh, I've sold some of my points for money. Oh, wow. I've, uh, I've got, several hundred thousand points still in my accounts. And uh, for most people, it's not realistic to do that. I've got, I've, in the last two and a half years, I've opened over 30 credit cards. Wow. Um, to put that in perspective. And I've gotten huge value out of it. 
but it's also a little bit of a hassle. It's worth the hassle um, mm -hmm. if you're willing to put in the time. But um, I would say realistically for most people, if you just open a card every three months, you open a new card, you put all your spending on that card so you meet the, uh, the requirement and then you just never use that card again um, unless you have some, some reason for using it. Um, and if you did four of those a year, you can easily earn enough for a, a free trip if you take one vacation out of the country a year um, or domestic or whatever. And uh, so I'd say that's the best way to go about it for the majority of people. And it's, it's not hard to keep track of four cards a year. Um, so, but you can make, you can really earn a lot from the sign up bonuses and, uh, um, bank accounts as well. I've, I got into that recently and I wrote a, wrote a blog post about all the, the points I've earned and the money I've earned over the last two and a half years with, uh, bank accounts and credit cards. And it's, it's mm -hmm. a lot like, <laughs> I would say in total value, it's probably 20,000 or more. So it's, wow. uh, it's, okay. a, it's a really big side hustle, I would say. Okay. Like, Okay. Um, yeah, that is not the first time I've heard of um, being able to use uh, those credit rewards or basically like the company's marketing money in order to incentivize to get you, get you uh, to buy their cards and, you know, to make charges onto it. Um, but if you're a listener and you're wanting to know more about that, I know there are uh, blogs like Jared had, has written about that. Um, you can do a Google, Google search and I, I know there's like tons of uh, websites on how to do it, but if you are interested in learning more about that, just reach out to me, um, maybe comment below on wherever you're listening to this and, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll be able to find, uh, somebody to come on about it. Or maybe Jared, we can have you back on and talk more about the credit card side of things. Well, that was the last of the questions from the listeners. Jared, did you have anything that else that you wanted to bring up for the listeners or talk about today? Yeah. So I want to emphasize the point of, uh, you know, making a plan for whenever you plan to retire, or, you know, you want to stop working or stop working full time, just come up with a plan. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always available. If you want to reach out to me, I can help you with it. But, um, but, try to try to determine what date you're shooting for, what number you need to get, uh, get to where you want to be and, um, start saving for that. And, and, uh, when I do all my calculations, I, um, I assume like a 7% return on the market, which hopefully will be a little bit conservative. Um, but I'd rather be conservative than be, um, uh, I guess overshoot the realistic mm -hmm. target. Um, and, just calculate that growth into your assumptions, um, whatever you invest and, and, um, see when you're going to get there. And if you're not getting there when you want to, then increase your savings rate. And, um, that's the best way to go about it. Um, also as far as financial independence goes and retiring early and everything, like I said, that has a lot of negative connotation, but, um, a, a lot of times most people, their unhappiness, I think with their jobs comes from the fact that you're, you're forced to do it basically. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, most people don't have the option to, to quit because their, their expenses are so high that they can't, they can't cover their expenses without working 40 hours a week. But if you had the option, so, um, say you only had to work 14 hours a week or 18 hours a week or something like that to, to cover all your expenses, I would say that the majority of people would cut down their hours. So reaching financial independence or getting closer to financial independence isn't about just, um, staying at home or whatever and wasting time. Um, it's about having more time with your family or more time to travel. Or, you know, if you only had to work 18 hours a week to meet your expenses, then what if you work full time half the year instead of working part time the whole year and you spend the rest of that year half or the other half of the year traveling? Like, I can't imagine many people don't want to do that. So um, it's, it's not about just not working. It's about having options. And uh, I think that once you have the ability to do anything you want and your expenses are covered, uh, it changes a lot of things for you. You, uh, you can determine what you really want out of life and what you, what's going to make you happy and what's going to make you want to get up in the morning and stuff like that. So, um, I think it's, it's for everybody, whether you want to retire early or not, um, figure out the number you need and try to get to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for those that are just coming out of school or starting, um, starting their career off, my thing, what I wanted to do coming out of school was develop a financial dream team. And so that included a financial advisor, which we've kind of talked about. You don't necessarily need. Um, but that also includes like a tax advisor and um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that I would want to include on the, on the, on the subject that we've been talking about, but basically, you know, one, 
you wanting to set yourself off on the right foot financially down the road so that you can have that freedom. And I think that's what we're really all after anyhow, especially listening to this, um, this show. We're all travelers. We all want the freedom of location. And I think yeah. that doesn't stop there. We'd also want financial freedom as well. Yeah, and travel the choice is, uh, to do what we want to do. Travel, I think, travel PT or travel OT or any kind of travel healthcare is uh, by far the best way to get there because I can tell you that had I taken a permanent job, I uh, still would probably – be reaching financial independence pretty early, but it probably would have been another five years. Like, and that's, that's a, that's a big amount of time. Um, traveling is, it's a great thing to do. Um, you can definitely save a lot more money that way. Um, and I think all of you guys that are starting out on this route or trying to determine if it's right for you, then at least give it a shot because mm -hmm. you're not really going to, not going to miss anything. Uh, worst case scenario, you go back home and find a permanent job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then any messages to, we, we've geared a lot of this towards, you know, the new grads or those just getting started on their journey. Um, would your message change to any of those who are kind of wrapping up their career? So maybe the ones who have um, worked the full time for a long while, the kids are out of the house and now they're starting on the travels um, or they're kind of getting close, more close to that, that retirement, their retirement age. Well, um, for those people, it's uh, even more important to at least have a goal in mind. And uh, like I was talk talking about earlier, it always amazes me. I've talked to people in their 50s and early 60s. And I'm like, uh, you know, they're talking about like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to retire. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you need to retire? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Well, how are you ever going to get to a target that you, you don't know what it is? So, um, yeah, I mean, you have to figure out what number makes realistic sense for you to retire. Um, you have to figure out how you want your retirement to be set up because mm -hmm. the cool thing as a traveler is what if you just take one assignment a year and you keep your expenses low and that's enough to cover the majority of your expenses and then you can live the rest of it off of uh, investments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a pretty cool retirement lifestyle, I'd say, um, or work PRN jobs or work part-time 20 hours a week or something mm -hmm. like that. But you just have to figure out, figure out your target, figure out how you can get there. That makes the most sense for you. Um, as far as investing, I would do everything the same. Um, Retirement accounts, I would, I would still invest uh, in those pre-tax accounts to try to get as much savings as possible. And um, there's actually, um, I think it's for 50 and over, you can, or maybe 55, but you can actually contribute more to both your 401k and your traditional IRA when you're older. Um, and that's for the people that are a little behind or uh, trying to save the last little bit, but they're still definitely beneficial. So mm. um, investing in those retirement accounts is still very important as you get older. Uh, even without as much compounding opportunity, it's still a, still a good way to go. Got and it. I would say that's probably the, the most important thing, figure out what you need um, and then make a plan to get there, figure out what you want your retirement to look like that will make you the happiest. Got it. Got it. And then we all can move to Morocco cause it's a little bit cheaper cost of living down there. <laughs> hey, Southeast Asia. I, uh, I've, I've, you know, a lot of travelers I think have gone there. Uh -huh. um, I don't know why that is, but um I guess probably it's a lot of it is the cost of living because yeah, I've, I've even had patients that were, uh, they had moved to Southeast Asia and they were just in town visiting and they talk about how amazing it is and how low the cost of living is. So it's definitely something I want to experience. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jared. This has been such a good series, such a good talk to sit down and just talk some money. I know it's been, it's a big question, whether you're um, a student, whether you're just coming out or, you know, the traveler, um, You've been in the travel game for a while, but for anybody who's wanting to get in contact with you, where would you like them to go? Yeah, if, uh, if you guys haven't figured it out by now, I love to talk about finance. Uh, I get a lot of questions to the blog about finance. Um, and it's probably my favorite subject, even over PT, which is kind of crazy considering I spent so much money uh, on my PT degree. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I spend more time learning about finance than I do about PT. It's kind of sad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so feel free to contact me. I'm always willing to talk about um, finance topics and uh, the best way to find me is on my blog, fifthwheelpt.com. Uh, fifth wheel all spelled out and then PT abbreviated. All right. And so I'll put those in the show notes for sure, as well as anything else that we talked about today. And uh, another avenue they can reach you at is the New Medical Nomads group on Facebook. You can just tag Jared in a question and he'll be sure to reach out to you. Um, if you're looking for the next official launch of the show, um, find it on the No Medical Nomads podcast Facebook page. That's where I officially launch everything. And then if you're looking for early access, you can find that on YouTube. But whatever you're listening to us on, whether it be YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, um, if you can 
click a like, show some love, give us a share. We greatly appreciate it. If you've learned something in this, put it below. If you know somebody who's talking about financial freedom or wanting to retire early, uh, please tag them below as well. That way we can reach the people that we're trying to reach with our message. But thank you so much, Jared. I appreciate your time and doing this marathon with me tonight. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no problem. And you have safe travels.